Wall Street. So uh, that's quite a controversial uh, word these days. Um, but tonight, we're going to hear from a different perspective uh, on this matter, uh, that of a mathematician. Uh, we're going to hear about um, what goes on behind the scenes, uh, different details of, uh, that go into you know, the market and Wall Street. Uh, our speaker tonight uh, is the director in the mortgage analysis at Citigroup uh, Global Markets, uh, focusing on the term structure modeling aspects of MBS valuation and hedging. Um, prior to uh, joining Citi, uh, our speaker worked at UBS um, at Deutsche Bank, as well as uh, some other smaller firms. Uh, before that, he uh, conducted um, research in algebraic geometry and taught mathematics in various institutions, including our very own uh, Stern College and Yeshiva College, to which uh, we warmly um, welcome back, and uh, as well as uh, Columbia, Johns Hopkins, and MIT. He uh, holds a BA, MA, and PhD uh, in mathematics from Columbia, Columbia University. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you tonight uh, Dr. Yaakov Karbishbach. Well, thank you for the introduction. And I would like to thank all of you for inviting me here. It's a uh, place uh, for which I have a very warm spot in my heart. I've worked here for five years at YC and Stern College. Uh, those are uh, indelible memories in my mind. I know there's several other schools, but nothing stands out as, as uh, we do. So, uh, a couple of uh, uh, warnings. Uh, so, this is a subject that uh, is very amorphous and I'll probably ramble in different directions, so please don't expect any kind of a uh, sort of straight line here. Uh, and almost anything I say is um, uh, only partially true and it's mostly representative of sort of my thinking on the subject or my personal experience. So uh, the word mathematicians here requires some definition. Uh, by mathematicians of Wall Street I mean people uh, who had some kind of a mathematical or physics uh, or related background and ended up working on uh, Wall Street. And what is Wall Street? Well, big banks, as well as hedge funds, as well as investment firms, as well as crops Oops. related uh, industries. So uh, a lot of things here will require uh, a long list of um, extra verbiage uh, to make it precise. So please don't expect that anything I say is literally true. Uh, but it's, it's sort of true. So uh, what I would like to communicate is uh, a little bit about uh, what, uh, what brought mathematics to Wall Street and mathematicians to Wall Street, uh, and what exactly they're doing there, and uh, how it feels, and what it might possibly mean for some of you if you are considering uh, what to do with yourself later on. So, uh, don't expect that you will hear any kind of real career guidance here, but uh, hopefully you will come out with a little bit more than you did before. So, um, the, uh, the first thing to say is that uh, this is not exactly a new story in the sense that uh, it's been a long time that people observe that there is something going on in the markets that requires uh, um, some explanations. So uh, probably the very first book that appeared to describe uh, kind of basically modern looking financial instruments such as uh, short trading, uh, calls and puts, forwards, or maybe futures, it's not very clear, uh, and of course stocks, is a book published in 1688 uh, in Amsterdam. And uh, that was fairly natural because that's where the very first stock exchange was located. In Amsterdam Bourse. Now, uh, when you look closely, it seems less exciting because they only had two stocks trading. Uh, that doesn't seem like much of a market, but the way to think of it is these were not just any stocks. Uh, these were the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch West India Company. Um, they don't exist exactly, but uh, since we're currently located in a uh, repossessed property of the Dutch West India Company, uh, you have to appreciate that they had a global reach and did a lot of interesting things. 
Um, slavery mostly, but you know, some other stuff. So uh, the way to think of these stocks is not as stocks, but more like indices. Because these were mega corporations of their days, and they did sort of a variety of different activities. So it's, it's probably better to think that these were some kind of S&P 500s, except there were no constituent uh, stocks at that time. These were the stocks. And what's traded is not so much the stocks as the uh, contract on these stocks that depend on their value, uh, such as uh, low in short, or trading some kind of an option, a call or a put, or even a forward. It's not very clear whether they meant forwards or futures, but these are minor details. So it, it's a little bit more like a commodities market these days. But nevertheless, it's a, a surprisingly modern description uh, that can be found in this book. And the uh, title conveys uh, some of the reasons that mathematicians uh, uh, found uh, sort of useful in, in uh, showing up on Wall Street. Well, it was always very confusing. The book is called The Confusion of Confusions. Uh, you may wonder why uh, a book published in Amsterdam was written in, in Spanish. Uh, and that's because uh, its author and the intended audience uh, were Spanish Jews who lived in Amsterdam and uh, either traded or were interested in trading on the Amsterdam Bourse. Uh, the author, this uh, uh, person, Don Jose de la Vega, uh, was a very busy guy. Uh, he uh, uh, wrote a Hebrew drama and uh, a huge amount of Spanish poetry and was also a merchant and wrote this book. But primarily he's remembered, unfortunately, for this book. His poetry apparently didn't quite. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it can be found. Uh, so uh, what's interesting about it is that from the very beginning, it seems that there were certain features of these markets that are completely contemporary. For example, there, there were some thoughts about the importance of information in setting the price. There were some thoughts about government regulation. For example, at one point, the Dutch government outlawed short selling, which often happens now as well. And uh, that, that uh, actually, that, that never took hold because they quickly discovered that without short selling, you don't have liquidity. So nothing trades if you can't express a negative view in the markets. So uh, some of this is, is very, very uh, modern. But the confusion in the title refers to the fact that they didn't really understand what was going on. This, this book is a book of dialogues that tries to clarify things, but they, they couldn't really understand many of the relationships going on. So since uh, 1688, a few advances took place. Uh, not that many, really, but uh, so uh, what happened is, uh, sometime in the 20th century, people realized that uh, there's a lot of mathematics going on. This started in 1900, the year 1900, uh, when a student of Poincaré, but apparently a very unloved student who received, you know, barely got his PhD with some sort of very, uh, very low citation by uh, Nain uh wrote about Brownian motion. And uh, Brownian motion is a subject that was first mathematicized by Einstein, but that was actually five years later. So weirdly enough, this appeared in finance, it appeared earlier. And Bachelier basically uh, realized that if you want to describe the behavior of stocks in a market, uh, maybe you should look at the Brownian motion, which is a type of stochastic process. Unfortunately, nobody really read Bachelier for at least 50, 60 years. So only towards the second half of the uh, 20th century did people realize that there was actually any work on kind of early mathematical finance. By that time, there was a fantastic subject developed, but for completely different purposes. The subject of stochastic processes. And uh, it was developed either by pure mathematicians and statisticians, or by people working in particle theory. For example, thinking about what happens to some sort of a neutron bouncing uh, between some barriers. Well, you know, what, new, what, what a neutron is doing is not all that different than what a stock is doing, as it turns out. And certain concepts appear uh, that, that are very useful in finance. Uh, that is a very strange thing, and I'm not sure that anybody truly understands why that is. But uh, I'll give you a, 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 an exceedingly brief summary of what 
recurrent thinking, kind of recurrent deep thinking, is about uh, the kind of mathematics that should be used to describe financial assets. So, uh, well, what, what are assets? Well, we are primarily thinking of prices of things like stocks or bonds or some kind of rates. And, well, every day you look at them and they bounce around. Well, that looks fairly random, and random processes is another name for stochastic processes. But mathematicians have worked out a whole, a, a whole sort of uh, framework how to understand the key features of those processes that are really interesting and useful. Because saying that something is random without adding detail is, is pretty useless. So uh, the mathematical uh, formalism requires that we think of the stochastic process as a very random thing. So what probability theory does uh, has to be now extended in time. Imagine sort of a, a very uh, uh, a very um, set of uh, probability books. You know, basically something that happens only uh, for a single sample space is still happening for that single space, but is now extended in, in a time dimension. So instead of a single random variable, you have many indexed by time. And this progression of time has to be somehow indicated in, in more ways than just assigning a letter T. Well, people came with, with this, uh, came up with this very interesting notion of a filtration. So you look at all the possible events that uh, make some kind of sense in this situation, and you single out uh, a filtration of these events by those events that are known by Excuse time. Me, interrupt you, I'm sorry. Anybody with the name Shimon Paul downstairs from Fruit Platter? No. Thank you, I'm sorry. Does that right? <laughs> so, uh, so you want uh, you want to single out somehow uh, those events that are that have happened by time t and those that happen later. So, um, well, intuitively, that's obvious. But how do you say this mathematically? Well. Mathematically, you introduce a uh, set of sub-sigma algebras. I will not try to explain this, but I'm sure that several people here uh, on the faculty have explained this more than once, or will explain this in the near future. And uh, let me just simply say that uh, mathematicians found an excellent way of describing the progression of time, which is what you need to know for any stochastic process and describe something real like, like a, an evolving stock <coughs> of ice. And uh, the most important thing about these things is a second concept. You see, all of this is very nebulous until you, you are able to get some numbers in your hands. How do you get numbers out of stochastic processes? Well, you take expectations. And the most important thing is to be able to take the expectation on those processes, those events that have taken place by time t. And this is formalized by this concept of the conditional expectation conditioned on those events that have already occurred by time t. This still sounds fairly nebulous, so I'm just trying to assure you that there are perfectly precise ways of computing this, obtaining actual numbers out of this. And where does it all go? So we've got some kind of expectation, so on. Uh, a few more words. So. Uh, all of this requires a measure. You know, if you if you talk about probability as well, probabilities require probability measure. Well, it turns out that one measure is not good enough. You need to look at other measures that are equivalent to it. And what's what's equivalent? Well, a measure is equivalent to another measure if what they define as sets of measure zero are the same. Okay, that's the definition. Uh, well, that requires a few more things. So. Uh, Arbitrage. Now that sounds more financial, but you know, here is something that you could define without any reference to money. Imagine a process which is at the beginning uh, its value is zero, and later we, we fix some horizon in the capital T, and uh, with probability one, it's uh, it's non-negative, and uh, in fact, uh, with some positive probability, it's positive. Now think of it as some sort of a price process or wealth process or something that describes some portfolio. Imagine a portfolio that's worth zero now, but with probability one, it's not going to be negative at some point in the future. That means you're not going to lose money with probability one. 
and in fact with some positive probability you'll make money. Well, that's making something out of nothing. That's called arbitrage. Is that supposed to happen? Well, you know, maybe it's not supposed to happen, but it certainly happens sometimes. Um, okay, that's something to keep in mind. Martin Mills. So I, I gather that in one class uh, that word was mentioned today. So uh, all stochastic processes are way too many. It's sort of like talking about all functions. Well, there is a very interesting subset. Uh, in fact, there are a couple of theorems uh, of, of sort of great depth, which basically say that there is a, uh, an equivalence of categories between martingales and random variables. So imagine that sort of you have this seemingly a huge collection of random variables, and yet it's the same as some, some random variable. Those are the convergence theorems for martingales, but we won't go there. So uh, what's a martingale? Well, imagine that this uh, conditional expectation at time now, for example, of this process in the future is its value today. So what we expect for this thing to happen in the future is what we have done. Well, that seems very limiting, but that's what a martingale is. It's the process for which we don't expect anything to change in the future. Of course, it's quite random, but in terms of expectations, we expect what we have today. Okay, that doesn't seem like that much to work with, but it turns out to be exceedingly useful. And uh, finally, a, uh, yet another French word, uh, numeraire. So uh, what's a numeraire? It's basically any asset uh, subject to very trivial conditions. I mean, you don't want it to be negative, you don't want it to pay dividends, but whatever. Just about any asset, but you simply single out in, in some economy a particular asset. Which asset? Well, you could change it. The beautiful thing is, you know, it will be whatever it is that seems useful for a particular calculation. So what do you do with all this? You price assets. So uh, now which assets? You may think like, why do mathematicians have to price assets? Don't you have a stock market to do that? Well, you have the market mechanism to price basic basic assets like stocks or bonds or whatever is traded on a regular basis, but you have a myriad of derivatives, which are basically functions of those things, except the their payoffs are supposed to occur at some point in the future. So how are you supposed to know what they're worth today? Well, the very profound uh, theorem, which is not exactly true, but with enough conditions, you have a family of theorems which are saying something like that, says that if there is no arbitrage in a given economy, then you can construct a measure equivalent to whatever measure you already got there, uh, and take some numerator, a special numerator for this matter, such that when you discount by that number, basically when you when you take a relative price, so the price of an asset is sort of got lost, but discounting by that special single down asset makes it a numerator, not in the first measure that you had, but in, in some other measure. So somehow, uh, you find that anything of interest becomes a numerator with some work. It becomes a Martin Miller, I'm sorry, with, with some work. Uh, and why is that so great? Well, remember what the Martin Miller is for. They do very simple things. They, uh, the value today is the expectation in the future. So you put all of this together, and you discover that if that relative uh, price is a martingale, well, just reading that definition says that the current value of the asset must be a certain expectation. The expectation of some discounted thing, but you know, something you can sort of work with. Now, to work with it, you have to know some math because uh, practical ways of computing these expectations are not exactly trivial. They require typically either Monte Carlo methods or uh, lattice methods. Uh, to get to that point, you may need to understand that uh, these prices also satisfy certain differential equations and so on. But, you know, that, that's what well, there's a lot of math there. But this is an amazingly profound thing, and meaning it becomes useful if you think about it long enough and if you understand what goes in. But it suddenly says 
this takes the mystery out of uh, asset pricing. It's no longer a question of sort of how do we even begin pricing some option. Well, here's how, here's the price, and you just need to sort of figure out what these things mean in any concrete case for any particular derivative. And now it may not be a simple matter, but at least it tells you where, where to start and, and sort of if you get stuck on the way, you can ask your friends. So uh, this is an amazing advance that took place uh, in stages uh, sometime in the uh, probably um, 1970s, 1960s. The big uh, breakthrough was the black Scholes formula for which Black and Scholes, uh, well, actually Black and Martin got, uh, well, Scholes and Martin got uh, a Nobel Prize, which is a little bizarre because it's kind of an exercise at an advanced college level. But the profound stuff about Martingales and Numbers and all that came kind of gradually before and after. And, uh, you know, the Lecture's formula itself is, is not really, it's not going to get you the job. But uh, all of this together does help to price essentially arbitrarily complicated objects, or at least helps you begin working on these problems. So uh, this was a phenomenal advance, and uh, to, to make some sense of it, it helps to have a decent mathematical education. Um, it helps to know the medical methods of various sorts. So uh, you would think that, you know, Wall Street is full of mathematics. Uh, well, you know, so everything I said is true, but it's also true that, uh, you know, there are other things which are true at the same time. So, uh, in reality, most people who trade, who make a living by working the markets, uh, don't know any math and don't even need to know any math. So, uh, they may have to use some models because, uh, you know, the relations require that, but it's done in a very formal way, you know, they have some systems running and they produce some numbers and this goes into some files or databases and, may argue that some of those numbers show too much risk, but it's, it's, it's a small fraction of all traders who really have a decent understanding of these models and really use them in any kind of meaningful way. Some do, some do. So, so everything I say is sort of both true and not true, it just depends on who you're talking about. But there's certainly a fraction uh, in some markets that pay attention to these things. Do you need this to trade stocks? Probably not. But do we need this to trade uh, some kind of exotic <coughs> derivatives or options uh, embedded in, in certain bonds? Well, yeah. And um, those traders tend to understand at least something about this. And uh, now, you know, uh, another fact is that even if uh, some of this is very interesting mathematically, and if some mathematics is involved, it's not always in New York. You know, this, uh, this place is sort of a little bit like Amsterdam in, uh, you know, in the sense that there was a time when it was sort of ahead of the world, but uh, it's not necessarily true. So a lot of this migrated to London, uh, plus we had a little crisis in the last few years, and uh, a lot of this sort of exotic trading is simply not done for a while. Uh, it might be bad, but, but you know, the, the volume is uh, down, and the, the more complex instruments suffer the most, that, that makes sense. Uh, nevertheless, a certain amount still keeps happening. Uh, now, as far as the mathematicians as opposed to real traders are involved, so, uh, well, they, they also don't use any math uh, as a group. Uh, they do a little bit, but, but not that much. So, if you ask what's a typical mathematician doing on Wall Street at any given time on any given day, it's very unlikely that they're trying to prove a theorem. I mean, it happens sometimes, but that's just not that likely. Mostly they're, you know, probably trying to uh, uh, debug some program or, or chasing uh, some data or so doing something fairly unexciting. But, you know, anytime they look for a job, they'll be quizzed on everything I mentioned before and much more. And quizzed quite seriously. I do it all the time. It was done to me every time I look for a job. And so at the very least, you need uh, a fair amount of uh, mathematical finance just to get a job. And uh, why is that done? Well, because sometimes you do need it. Now, how often that, that, that <coughs> could not be predicted? For the vast majority, very little. For a few people, something comes up all the time. 
uh, when it does come up, it's, well, by and large, very, very trivial. But again, sometimes it's not trivial. Now, what's not trivial is not always something of deep mathematical complexity, but even when it's something very simple, the question is how do you appreciate that that's what it is? I mean, very often what you're presented is a jumble of uh, poorly defined uh, things which look very confusing and contradictory and people kind of throw it at you and hope that you'll sort it out. So part of being a mathematician is being able to conquer that complexity and sort it out and figure out what depends on what and then sort of uh, put some kind of water into that. That's a very big part of what mathematicians actually do and how they add value, even if it's not classifiable as, as mathematics per se. And then a small percentage of cases does involve uh, real math, not necessarily very advanced, but recognizing how to use something correctly, uh, recognizing what to use and what not to use, or what makes sense, what's still defined, and so on. So, in my experience now, you know, I come from uh, being a pure mathematician, not applied. Uh, it could be a disadvantage, but, you know, you do what you know how to do. So, my uh, advantage is to recognize something at the high level, so that's what I do. So, I found it useful to operate at that level rather than being very good at, uh, you know, solving some equations or, or uh, rewriting formulas in a clever way, I, I, I found on many occasions that what's useful is to realize that some function is not linear, or that uh, some way you have uh, an expectation and not just a deterministic function, or some way you have an ill-defined uh, concept that's actually confused with another concept and they should be separated. Things of that sort, uh, I think occur very often, and that's what mathematicians, in my opinion, add value. At least that's what I found uh, some ability to add value. Obviously, you also have a small number of people who actually solve um, boundary value problems, problems like, like Professor Outway, uh, but not very much. Um, now, so here's an example of a very, very elementary thing, which is unfortunately or fortunately very typical uh, about what, what's going on. And I'll, I'll do it very sketchily, uh, so not everything here is made very precise. But very often you have uh, a, uh, say, security whose price depends on more than one thing in fact, it's almost never the case that it depends on only one thing. So, uh, for example, suppose you have a, uh, a mortgage-backed security. So what, what is that? That's uh, uh, a bond that pays uh, the money that something like a thousand different mortgage holders are paying and without their knowledge it's all pulled together and sent to some investors, maybe in uh, China, maybe in, uh, in, uh, in the US. And uh, well, what they pay uh, depends on the interest rates because they have this ability to prepay. It's an option. So if the rates drop, some, some fraction of them is going to prepay, and that will change the cash flows and will change the value of the bond. But it also depends, you see, uh, the, those rates, they, 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 uh, they move according to uh, what's called volatility. So these are basically standard deviations. And the market trades these standard deviations in, uh, in the form of so-called swaptions. So those are not exactly the same as, as the ones experienced by the rates, but there is some connection there. So uh, you could say that the, uh, the price of the bond is, is, the, is a function of some rates, R, and volatility is V. I, I will not say whether it's one variable or many, let's pretend it's one. Uh, the problem is that it's, uh, it's a little messy than that because those volatilities depend in turn on the level of rates. Uh, how do they depend? Well, sort of like, like, like this curve is trying to indicate. So typically, so this is called the, the volatility skew. The, uh, uh, if the general <coughs> level of rates is, is low, then you find that these volatilities tend to spike. And if it's high, then they tend to go down. Uh, there are many reasons for that. But, uh, the point is that you have a function of two variables, but one of these variables happens to depend on the other. Well, believe it or not, this is a very confusing situation for, for most people in Wall Street. And that's where PhD mathematicians make their mark by recalling that there's something called chain rule. Uh, 
that allows you to correctly calculate the full derivative of the price with respect to the rent, as the formula below indicates. Now, I enumerated the challenges here, so I, I'm not kidding. These challenges are very profound. The first thing is, you know, what I presented to you in, in kind of calculus one language is usually hidden. I mean, they, they give you sort of some very confusing uh, spreadsheets or tables or, I mean, they, they can't enunciate what's going on. So it's your job to kind of translate it into some sensible mathematical language, even if it's very, very trivial. It's not necessarily the first thing that comes to mind when you listen to uh, some business people. The second thing is, uh, well, some of them actually heard about chain rule. It's interesting that many of them are somewhat mathematically educated, but they have trouble using it correctly. So they often write something slightly wrong. Um, so you have to help them along and straighten it out. And now the biggest challenge might be to explain to them what you've done because they may argue uh, against it. They, this may not make any sense to them and you can't exactly refer them to a, uh, a textbook. I mean, you have to sort of provide an explanation that uh, that's basically a one-liner and makes an intuitive sense. Well, can you do that with every mathematical theorem? So, uh, for example, one of, my, uh, one of my colleagues told me that one trader looked at uh, looked at some uh, probabilistic formulas and was very puzzled by the fact that there is a pi uh, in, um, in the formulas for the, uh, for the normal distribution. He said, well, you know, I know some math and I know that pi means that there's something round. Well, can you tell me what's round about the normal distribution? Well, my colleagues certainly could, but not in a very simple way because that happens in a complex domain. Whereas this domain was firmly in the real world. So, um, you know, there are challenges and you can't always come up with a good answer. Um, anyway, so this is an example of something fairly trivial, but there are still challenges of recognizing what's going on and, and being effective about carrying it out. Sometimes there is more. Sometimes there is more. So, uh, I will not explain all the details, but Something that came up in my work uh, a couple of years ago, um, you have a, uh, as usual, you have some, uh, some prices or something, and you are able to compute very easily. You have some system, some existing computer system that's not easy to change. And it spits out some sequence of numbers, which happen to be the sensitivities of uh, your security of your, of your price to some set of coordinates. Unfortunately, the trader doesn't want those coordinates. He wants sort of different coordinates because he's hedging with some instruments for which some other coordinates are much better. But the problem is that to go from these coordinates to the other coordinates is not straightforward. Now, you do have the Jacobian, uh, which gives you the sensitivities of one set of coordinates with respect to the other. So you would think, well, so what's the big deal? Just take its inverse and call it there. The problem is when you do this, you get the new set of sensitivities and the trader will throw you out because the first set of sensitivities look very, very smooth. I mean, the nearby uh, y1, y2, well, let's say x1, x2, x2, and so on, those, those sensitivities, the derivatives with respect to axis, were all kind of naturally progressing. So, for example, df dx2 was reasonably close to df dx1 and not very different from df dx3. But the sensitivities that come out on the y side are all over the place. They're jumping from enormous positive values to enormous negative values <coughs> because basically there's some kind of averaging going on and transitioning to the y uh, variable somehow ruins that pleasant uh, averaging. So what to do? Well, the first thought is, well, I'm inverting this G-cogin. There's going to be a better way. And mathematics, applied mathematics, is full of all kinds of pseudo inverses. Now, I was never trained as an applied mathematician, so maybe if I were trained as such, maybe I would find what to do, but I looked at a bunch of things and I talked to people, but nothing works. Just nothing works. I mean, you can try all kinds of techniques and they produce, well, some other teeth, but, but they're all teeth. None of them is very smooth. None of them is any good for the trader, and this can end very badly. I may have to go and talk about Montevideo's again. So, um, I realized that I should, I should try to be an applied mathematician since I'm really not. 
uh, I should try to think like a uh, normal institution. So uh, what, uh, what occurred to me is I'm trying to square uh, something that cannot be squared. I mean, these, these axes and y's, they don't live in the same place. So there's actually no rational way to connect, uh, to connect these different marshals. So that Jacobian that, that could be written is some sort of a fiction. It's, it sort of it represents something, but it's not an accurate connection between the X and the Y worlds. So instead, I should think that there are, uh, there's a space of sensitivities with respect to X's, X. There's a space of sensitivities with respect to Y, which is something else. And I will forcibly embed them together in a larger space so that at least I would have a chance to relate them to each other. I, I'm not describing any details. I mean, it's, it's a little bit vague at this level. But basically, the first step is to connect them where there is no proper connection, sort of find a larger space that contains them both, and then uh, create a projection of this larger space on the Y uh, uh, subspace. And now I can compose like a normal mathematician does every day to uh, mappings and injection and a projection. And well, I have very, very concrete formulas for this, so here's my connection. And what do you know? This works far better than any pseudo inverse produces a wonderful, very smooth pattern. Everybody's happy. And now, when I try to talk like this to the trader, that's a mathematical background. He uh, didn't take it kindly. But, you know, they like numbers. So basically, I, I stopped drawing pictures and I, I, I just showed him, you know. This is what you take, and this is what you end up with, and you will satisfy. So um, the beautiful thing is that they never have more than five minutes. So you know, if you can't explain it by then, but it seems to work well, so be. So uh, that's an example of you know something that happens uh, often enough. Um, now a lot of people in in finance actually work in something called risk management. And I myself worked for, for something that built itself as, a, as an independent risk bureau. Um, it went very up, but, but it was good for one. So um, it's a little mysterious what they do, but, uh, but it's very much part of sort of this general package of, of things that uh, mathematicians contribute to Wall Street. And uh, I gotta say a few words about it, and, and I'll mention some examples that came from the period when I worked for those guys. So uh, this represents kind of my view of uh, of the uh, uh, discipline of risk management. Uh, it could add value, but in practice, it seldom does. However, from the mathematical point of view, there are lots of interesting things that happen there. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you sort of a little bit of not terribly advanced stuff, but. Uh, something. So, um, risk managers look at certain risk uh, so statistics. You, you need to describe the risk of your portfolios in some language, and seemingly the best uh, statistic that they came up with <coughs> is what's called value at risk, or VAR. So, this is not to be confused with uh, variance. So, observe the R is capitalized. Nothing to do with, well, some people would say it's not that much. So uh, the definition is very, very simple. You say you have to decide on some level of certainty, for example, 95% certainty. Uh, and whatever level it is, you define, you look at the distribution of profit and loss for your portfolio, and you simply cut it off at the point such that with 95% certainty, you're not going to lose more than this much. So you're saying, look, you know, of course you could lose everything. But that's not actionable. You're not gonna, you're not gonna save yourself from that opportunity. So uh, what's actionable is sort of some kind of reasonable day-to-day -day risk. And uh, value at risk is a good measure for this actionable level of risk. So uh, there is something very interesting about it. Lots of things very interesting. So uh, in my mathematical days, I looked occasionally at probability and statistics, and I never came across this thing. And when I had to study it, I realized that there isn't very much in the standard statistical literature that, that describes it. Uh, it's somehow not very typical of other statistics that you find uh, in those courses. And uh, one interesting thing about it that people 
took to be a bad thing is that it's not subjective. Meaning, suppose your notion of risk is far. Uh, well, whatever. This, this number is what you call risk. So the usual thing is you imagine if you combine several assets together, that's safer than, than investing in any one of them. Well, it turns out that depending on what those things are, you may come across a situation where uh, the risk of the combined portfolio is more than the risk of the individual guys rather than less. So at least by that metric, it might say that sometimes diversifying is actually a bad idea. Um, now, so some people think that, that's, that's, that, seems, that that simply means that this is a bad metric, that this is not the right way to measure risk, and so they come up with so-called coherent measures of risk that don't have this problem. But to my mind, it's not a problem, it's a feature. It's, 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 a, it's a, uh, uh, an indication that there's something interesting about risk, that, that it's not a trivial matter. So anyway, uh, if you like VAR, you will love marginal VAR, because you're looking at big portfolios, and you want to know if you have sort of more risk than yesterday. You want to know where, where is that coming from? Which portion of my portfolio is contributing that extra risk? So. Uh, Marginal VAR is a, is a metric that allows you to single out how much each position in your portfolio contributes to the total. So you simply take the VAR of the whole thing and subtract the VAR of the portfolio minus that thing. So take it out of the portfolio, measure VAR again, take the difference. That gives you a way to uh, quantify the contribution to risk of this one position. A very straightforward definition and uh, sounds like you should be able to do this very easily. Now, mechanically, it's very trivial to do this. And by the way, how do you compute VAR? Uh, you simulate your portfolio, let's say, a thousand times. You get a thousand numbers. You rank them from top to bottom. And you take the 51st number from the bottom. That's your 95% certainty bar. Okay. And so that's very straightforward to find. So you can find this number. You can find that number, subtract. The problem is that you're basically getting garbage for most positions. If your positions are small, uh, you can calculate that actually what you're getting, the error in that value is more or less comparable to the value itself. So you're mostly capturing some kind of noise. So that's not good. Um, so uh, I was thinking about this, and here's what I came up with. Now, being a, 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 a geometer, well, I think geometrically, what can I do? So uh, I don't want to think about statistical subtleties of war. I think of so the bar is a piece of geometry. Now, what's geometry about this? So let's add some parameters to the story. Instead of just P and X, let's put some, some uh, let's stretch them, by, let's scale them by some parameters, S and T, whatever. So you get a function of two variables, and it's homogeneous. Any reasonable measure of risk is homogeneous uh, in, in these components. Well, up to a point. You sort of, if you take a very large position, then liquidity issues make it not very homogeneous. But to the first approximation of certain homogeneous. So uh, its graph must look like a cone, not necessarily a round cone or even elliptical, but a cone in the sense that it's made of straight lines. Uh, okay, that's, that's, that's a start. Uh, as a geometer, I, I was happy to see a cone. And then, uh, now, what does this have to do with our original question? Well, we had just one of portfolio, not some multiple of the portfolio. So you slice it at S equal 1. And what do you, suppose this was a real cone, the, the usual cone. Well, you slice it, you get a conic section. Which one? A hyperbola. Uh, well, that makes me very excited. So uh, uh, the point is that even if it's not a real hyperbola, which usually it's not, it still has two asymptotes. Well, that means that I can pretty easily estimate where they are. So I'll take some measurements for larger t. So my position is somewhere pretty small, close to zero. But I'll take t large and maybe t very negative and just compute a couple of points in this hyperbola and that will give me enough information to estimate it reasonably closely. And then I can read off my marginal bar from that hyperbola. And a simple-minded idea, but that turned out to work reasonably well and gave very satisfactory results. So uh, again, the moral is, I mean, this particular story is, uh, doesn't have any real generalization, but I found that thinking 
that understanding method is sort of more highbrow perspective, not just at the level of formulas, but kind of what these formulas mean, not looking at a matrix, but thinking of a transformation or a, uh, not thinking of a, uh, uh, you know, just, just some sort of a uh, uh, quadratic form of thinking of a, of a human product. I found that those, those ways of thinking are helpful and instead of regression, I always think of a projection, instead of a correlation, I always think of uh, some sort of a uh, cosine, you know, so uh, I find that, uh, not that it's always doing something for you, but it seems to do more than, than just being very good at cranking formulas. So I urge you to read the uh, theorems that look kind of obscure and too abstract because that may be your meal ticket one day. Um, anyway, so uh, from hyperbole, I will move to the hyperbole. <laughs> so uh, as I promised, this will be a ramble from one subject to another. So. Uh, even though we don't always do anything all that great, some other people think that we do. And after the latest uh, little financial hiccup, uh, a lot of different publications basically uh, came to the same conclusion, you know, searching for, for the uh, culprits of the global financial crisis. They understood that it's the quants who did it. So um, my... Uh, you know, I have mixed reactions about this, but you know, I'm trying to stay on a positive note. So, uh, you know, it's great that somebody thinks that we have that much power. <laughs> I don't think we should go through. So, uh, uh, let me just say a few words about what exactly, uh, how this is classified. So, uh, by this, in this picture, by quants, I mean both quants in the narrow sense, uh, people who do. Uh, who have some kind of a mathematical background and do uh, modeling, that's fairly mathematical, and also anyone whose job is in the financial industry and is somewhat somewhat mathematically meaningful, has some mathematical content. So in the largest sense, you have many more people with job descriptions that are quite different, and I certainly didn't list all of them here, but... Um, um, my personal opinions are very clear. Some of these jobs I think are not bad, and some are not that great. Uh, some are a little bit of both. So, uh, what's good about being a trader or a portfolio manager is not that you do a lot of math, you usually don't. But uh, they make a lot of money and they make decisions. Uh, a traditional relationship between a trader and a desk one, someone who actually works on the issues traders right now is that the quant would provide the head over which the trader would break the phone uh, when something doesn't work. So it, it improved. You know, these days the phones are usually embedded in the desk. You can do that. So, uh, but still, it's pretty clear who's who's boss. Uh, on the other side, you have some people who, you know, some of them rise through the hierarchy. For example, some risk managers actually make a reasonable amount of money, but my feeling is that in practice their jobs are very annoying because uh, they're not truly real. I mean, they, they, there's some kind of compliance people who, uh, who produce reams of numbers and do some studies, but then nobody truly cares. It's done quite formally. Now, it could add value, but in practice, by and large, it doesn't. So, uh, um, a lot of this stuff actually is quite mathematically intense. For example, model validators are without exception math PhDs or math or physics PhDs and, and uh, have to do a lot of work, very similar to quants, except it's not for, for real. They're supposed to independently create a model that's sort of like the model that's actually used and somehow use that as a basis for validating the model that is used. In practice, they have either time or information needed to uh, accomplish their task, and it's it's uh, quite annoying, and most of them are very unhappy. And so there is a definite drift of people from this direction to the left. Uh, most of them will never reach their goals, uh, but you know uh, they certainly know what they would like. So in that sense, you know, I, now you know this has to be placed in a context because uh, it's not like the rest of the world is all. 
rosy. I mean, most jobs are probably not that great. For example, an average lawyer is doing something along the lines of regulators or model validators. I mean, they're all compliance people. Um, so, you know, many, many people in, in today's economy are doing something of regulatory nature that's fairly formal and uh, probably not terribly satisfying. But, you know, some find something good about it. Um, also, it's not to say that every trader is, is so happy they have enormous stresses. And many of them don't last very long. Um, some make money and uh, uh, do well, but just as many don't make any money and end and, uh, up and, uh, uh, badly. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not all that simple. But uh, what I want to say is that um, as many of you are pursuing some kind of studies with mathematical content, you very likely find um, a place somewhere in this ecosystem simply because New York uh, is mostly big driven by this industry. So if you plan to stay in the city, um, there's a decent chance that you'll, you'll be somewhere on this chart. And you know, if you can if you can help it try to be on the good side. But um, it's not completely predictable. And uh, in any case, there's some mathematical content. And uh, also, what I want to say is that despite all the advances, we are really still in a, in a uh, there, there's enough sort of mystique remaining, and, and many areas of finance are just as confusing as they were to uh, Jose de la Vega in uh, 1688, uh, despite all the work that we've done since. So, um, 